Awesome. Thank you, Mark and Julie and Western for welcoming me back to Western. Um, I was there until uh, late last year, and so it's great to be to be back again. Uh, I'm really excited to be sharing a little bit about my journey, but also, um, you know, what you could be doing in your research uh, to, to get onto social media, talk about your research, your passion and your expertise, uh, and open yourself up to a lot of opportunities. So I'm going to start with a little bit of uh, sharing my screen because there's only so much you can look at me. I'll be sharing great pictures and some tidbits uh, that you can um, look at. So amazing. Um, all right. So imagine um, you get an email from the world's largest pu book publishing house asking you if you're interested in authoring a book with them. And uh, they saw a YouTube video of you, uh, you know, talking about the area of your expertise, and they think you would be the person to write this book. Now, this is exactly what happened with me. Um, this was fall of 2021, when DK Publishing House, which, you know, you may have read a lot of books from DK growing up, um, they reached out to me, uh, seeing if I would want to author this book. And the interesting part is that um, they watched a YouTube video of me talking to a bunch of middle school students, um, talking to them about space, uh, what my passion was, and answering their space questions. And just based on that, um, they thought that I would be great at taking a lot of uh, content about space and putting that in a 96-page book um, that was aimed at five to eight years old, eight-year-old kids. And I couldn't believe myself that a YouTube video, and I don't have a many YouTube videos, it really only takes one <laughs> to get you an opportunity like that. And, and so today I will mention, you know, some of the opportunities that I've had, you know, big and small that have come my way because I have been on social media talking about, you know, my passion, um, how I like to do things in terms of, you know, developing activities, testing them out with youth. And then also someone who's eager to work with educators and organizations uh, to bring space uh, to public and youth. And so I've kind of established myself uh, as a brand, uh, as someone who loves space, someone who loves working with people, and someone who's a great communicator. And today I'll share some of those tidbits with you and how you could create your own brand on social media, um, as well as in person, uh, but communicate your research uh, to create that expertise uh, that you can bring to people, not only right here in Canada, but also across the world. But before I do that, I really want to learn a little bit about you. So we'll start by, uh, you know, getting a little bit uh, to, to know whether or not you use social media platforms uh, to communicate your research. And this could be specifically the research you do or um, it could be, you know, just something that's in the area of your expertise. So, for example, um, I talk a lot about space, even though my expertise is really in star formation. So we're going to do that using Slido. Um, so if you, since you're all joining from either phone or um, your laptop, um, I will head to Slido. And I would love for you to just go to Slido.com, enter in this number, or if you have... Um, you know, phone, just take it out, uh, use the QR code. And then I would love for you to answer whether or not you use your social media um, to communicate your research. So let's let's see, we have a few people that say no. We have a few that say, that say yes. And one of the things I would mention, and as we go through this, uh, this talk, um, you will learn how it's really important when you're talking to someone to know a little bit about them. And it is a little bit harder to do this in an online format. So this is one way of me kind of getting to know you um, and how many of you have done something like this before and how many of you are new. So this really helps me understand um, what I'm gonna talk about. If everyone here was already communicating um, their research on social media, I would take a little bit of a different uh, take. But as you can see on the screen, we have around 62% um, that have not communicated or not used social media platform to communicate their research. Well, we do have 38% who are already doing so. So I will be kind of tailoring my talk um, based on who I know the audience is. And this becomes very critical when you're talking to people on social media because it's kind of a similar format where you're not sitting in front of them and you cannot get to know them, but you're really using 
what do you know about your audience to communicate with them just online? All right, so let's go back. Um, thank you for participating. Um, and I will go back and we will um, go back to the presentation. All right, so thank you for that. Um, one thing we want to start with is why you you should communicate on social media. And, you know, if you were to just ask me, I would say, you know, it's interesting because I consume a lot on social media. So if I think about it, it really sounds like, you know, I am looking at um, content such as educating um, people, engaging with people, inspiring people. Um, also, then in terms of a researcher, it would be a lot great for me to have a network of people who are either in the same field or wanting to get into the same field and then also entertain people. So these are some of the things that we think about when we think why we should be communicating on social media. But, you know, if I go back to myself as a researcher, I want to go back to research. And <laughs> what does research say about communicating, about academic researchers communicating on social media? And research actually shows that it really helps in career development, research and teaching, and direct results include things like improved communication, increased opportunities and contacts, but also increased student learning. So for example, if you're teaching a class and you're looking for innovative ways to be teaching that class, pop onto social media and ask your fellow, you know, scientists or researchers how you would want to teach that class. So it's a really great place to be communicating and creating network as you go through your journey as a researcher. Now, this is a study that was published in 2021. Obviously, it has been continuously being studied, it has been shown that it is really important for a researcher to be on social media and engaging. Um, today, I'll talk a little bit about um, engaging just with the public, but we can also talk about, uh, you know, if you have questions, feel free to ask me at the end uh, on how to do, you know, more networking on social media um, with your peers and your colleagues. So my social media journey and kind of building my brand started really when I started to work um, on a podcast. So I was at the tail end of my master's, um, there was an email that came in saying they're looking for volunteers to, you know, um, work in this new uh, radio show that was called Western World, um, and they needed someone to to just be an editor. And so I actually volunteered to uh, just be the behind the scenes person because I wanted to improve my listening skills. Now, I was born and brought up in India, so even though I studied in an English medium school, for me, English was still a language that I was trying to still learn, even though I had been in the country for around five, five and a half years. Um, and so I took this opportunity up, but what ended up happening was they needed someone to produce the entire show. Um, this included, you know, uh, interviewing uh, uh, experts, but also editing and then creating content on social media and posting about it as well. Uh, so a lot of that kind of fell onto my plate and I learned on the job how to do those. And then that allowed me to build a lot of communication skills. And I did not intend to do that at the start. It was really something um, that came about. And, and then I also started working at the observatory. So Cronin Observatory, if you have been on campus, it's right next to the engineering building. I started working in their outreach program and similarly, um, you know, creating content, but this time it was more in person engagement with people and, and also still had to promote the programs and engage people online. So I was Again, in addition to the podcast, I was also then working on programming um, that included in-person engagement, so adding something new to what I was already doing. And this also helped me to kind of, uh, you know, A, get passionate <laughs> about uh, education, outreach, and communications, um, but also to build those skills, which I didn't have before I started. And then one of the interesting things was that throughout my grad school, I started, you know, volunteering and working in many different initiatives, uh, whether it was the observatory, uh, which actually ended up being a TA ship for me, um, or whether it was, you know, or working with um, uh, things like the, the tri astronomy triathlon we had, um, or hosting events on campus as well uh, that were related to space. And, and it gave me some of the skills that I didn't have before, uh, just by working in the podcast at the observatory. Um, this included talking to the media. And that was a new skill I learned again on the job, but it was very interesting that now not only was it communicating with the public um, 
in person and the youth as well in classrooms, but then also um, going on to a radio show or TV show to kind of talk about what exciting things we were doing at Western. Um, and so again, I built a skill during grad school. And so by the tail end, I think I was pretty, after four years of, of doing that, uh, pretty passionate about what I was doing um, because I had done it for so long. I got really good at it too. And so I decided that this is really where I want to go. So instead of going the traditional postdoc route, I decided that I will uh, continue to pursue uh, space education, outreach, and communications. And I ended up, you know, um, at Western leading uh, the, the education, outreach, and communications for Western space. And during that time, um, I was doing more <laughs> now that it was a full-time job. I was also training people. Uh, training, you know, educators to to bring space into their classrooms, training students to talk about space in classrooms or in general at events. Um, I also had a lot of opportunities to continue doing media interviews. Um, I also started getting a lot of speaking engagements, um, talking to, you know, uh, whether it's public, in library, or even classrooms. Um, and this was not only here in Canada, but also in India. When I do visit back home, I always get requests to be to be part of classrooms or, or talk to students. Um, one of the other things I continued doing was posting all about it on social media. So during grad school, I started off as someone, um, you know, posting content for um, you know, Western space and the Cronin Observatory. But at the same time, I was building my own social media where, you know, I was talking about the work that I was doing there, the research that I was doing, um, and making sure that people knew me as someone who talks about space, who also does research in space, um, and is good at communicating as well. So uh, it kept kept on going when it came to my own social media as well. And then eventually getting invited to doing panels and talks and which I do, you know, even today. So social media, I think played a really big role because if you can think about it, there are only so many people here in London that I would reach if I was doing this in person versus if I was online, I was reaching people across Canada and across the world too. So I've had opportunities to be on panels that were you know, in North America, but also uh, in Asia as well. So it gives you a really a comprehensive idea of how doing different things, but also making sure you're owning it on social media makes a lot of difference because people now see you from a certain lens. And that is what we call personal branding. So this is where you, you when you put yourself out there on social media, and this is true for in person as well. So if you're going to a conference, how do you want people to perceive you? What do you want people to know about you? So for me, like off the bat, I want to know people, I want people to know that I'm really passionate about education. I'm really passionate about space. I'm really passionate about communications. And so if you look at my social media, that's what you will get. And, and the key part here is to be visible to be visible to the right people. And what I mean by that is if you are looking to continue, let's say your research, go to a postdoc, or if you're a postdoc, you're looking for you know, uh, your next step in, in academia, you are going to connect with people from those areas. So for example, if I'm looking to go to a school uh, in North America to, to do my postdoc, I will connect with people there online. And, and that will give me a heads up on what the department looks like, who are, who are the people there. A lot of these researchers are online. And so this is how you can connect with them, learn about them, make a network before you even make an entrance <laughs> in, in, the, in the university. And so you can use social media to, to, to enable you to be able to do that. So how do you do that? That's that's a big question, right? Um, how do you figure out what, what is your personal brand? And that actually takes a lot of thinking. And the way I think about it is, what are you comfortable? You know, in the start, it may be very different. So if I think back to myself, I was comfortable sharing what I was doing when it came to outreach. I was comfortable sharing a little bit about my research but I was not comfortable uh, being the expert in space. So today, if someone gives me a call and be like, hey, let's talk about eclipse. Well, I study star formation. I'm not an eclipse expert, but hey, I can talk to you about eclipse because now I feel comfortable doing that. Five, seven, eight years ago, I would not have been comfortable doing that, right? So you need to make sure that you're comfortable 
and you can expand um, what you plan to talk about on social media as you go through. So it can evolve over time, but you can start with either your particular area of research or you can go more broader and you can do both if you like too. Um, so just an example I have on the screen here is either um, to be the space science expert, I would have thought about it this way, or I could have been a star formation expert. And so I obviously evolved to choose uh, you know, be, becoming a space science expert is just because I became more comfortable about the knowledge that I had and enough to be able to talk to public on social media about it. I could be in media as well. So how do you go about it? The way to go about it is, you know, thinking about communications in these five sort of questions. So one of the things that I did at the start of the talk was ask you about what you do in terms of you know the topic of this this talk so who your audience is is probably the most critical thing to think about are you going to be talking to your colleagues if you talk about that on social media that's a completely different way of talking about your research than if you were to you know talk to public about it and so talking to public about it you have to be very careful on the kind of words you use and the way you frame your research to them so Thinking about the public is probably the most important thing, and we'll go through how we can do that on social media in a second. The second thing to think about is what information you're passing on. And this is obviously going to be very much on the topic that you decide in terms of whether you're going to stick to your research or you're going to be talking about a more broader area of your research. Um, and, and it will also depend on what mode or platform you're going to be using to talking about it. And we'll go through this in a bit as well. And then the next thing is, why am I doing it? So for me, I'm passionate about, you know, talking about space, getting people excited and curious about it. Could be very different for you. You could be aiming to talk to public because, you know, you're looking for them to get engaged in the kind of work you are doing. It could even be that you're looking for, let's say, you know, I know that there are lots of clinical studies that happen on campus. And if you're looking for people to be part of your clinical studies, maybe your, your aim to share your research is to get more people to be part of your studies. And so you have to think about whatever piece of information you're gonna put out, what it is for, why you're doing, why you're putting it out. And then when you're communicating. So this is important in terms of, um, and if you look on social media, there are all these days that happen or weeks. So for example, we have in October World Space Week. So you will see a lot of science communicators talking about space during that week because it just makes sense to be, you know, kind of jumping on the bandwagon of what already everyone is talking about and what the big news is. So you can, based on your research area, figure out times when, when it is more popular to talk about certain things. And you can just jump on that bandwagon and create content to be able to, to go with that. And then last but not the least, um, we're gonna talk about how to communicate. Now, this is where you need to know the platforms, but also the whole idea beyond, behind how people consume a lot of the content on social media these days. And we'll kind of start with this part and then go back to, to everything, all the questions that, that I just mentioned. So let's start by talking about how am I communicating? If you're thinking about, let's say a movie that you're watching, it has a very classic storytelling arc that they're using. That is, they're introducing you to the, um, to the characters. They're building some of these tensions, which eventually goes to a climax and then, you know, happy ending and the movie is over. Um, this is great if you're making long form content. So, you know, think something like uh, YouTube. If you have half an hour to explain a topic, you can use this particular, particular, um, you know, format. However, given our short attention spans and how the social media has been built nowadays, we are more likely to see what we call uh, in, in communications a digital storytelling arc. This is where you start, you know, if you have watched a video or reel or TikTok, notice this, they will start with a hook so that you stop scrolling and watch their video. They start with a hook to then answer that, uh, you know, to the hook. So let's say if I say, did you know we have an eclipse coming up? Yes, we have an eclipse happening on April 8th. So you start with a hook, you answer that hook so that people are not like, oh my God, I have to wait until the end of the video to get the answer. But then you fill them with the context and the background information that is needed. 
And then you end with call to action, which a lot of people are like, you know, click subscribe and follow for more information. Um, and this digital storytelling arc is very important to have your mind kind of set to this because most people are consuming, you know, a lot of content that they aren't really, you know, paying attention to. If you get someone's attention, if they are staying for the whole 90 seconds with you, they want to know what, you know, what they're getting into and what they are going, like what's the next step for them to do. So using the digital storytelling arc will be something that is going to be really key in understanding and creating content. So you can use this arc um, to, to figure out what you want to say. You can use this in terms of a post as well. If you're planning to write blog post, that's something that, you know, I will not really cover this time or creating a podcast. Um, this is something you can also use. Well, podcasts are a little bit longer in terms of, you know, content, but hooking them in the first few minutes is what's going to have them stay for the rest of them. Same with the podcast. If you're reading an article, the title is something that draws people in. Same as the first few lines. You know, if I'm going to, I'm just like, title is really exciting. Let's go see what it is. And then the first few lines aren't that exciting. People are not going to stay for the entire article. So you just have to think from the perspective of a consumer, what they are thinking as they're consuming the content that you're creating. Okay. So now let's talk about the platform. So I will talk about the platforms in terms of what um, the most used platforms are for researchers. And this doesn't mean that you cannot use the ones that I'm talking about at the last. It just means that um, you will have to you, you will have to think of why you are doing it because each of the social media platform has its own audience um, and how you communicate on it. So so that varies with each of the platform and it really really depends on what you um, decide to do. And for a lot of people, they concentrate on one platform over others. So they will still be present on the other platforms, um, but they won't be posting as much content. And the reason for that is content creation is time consuming, depending on which platforms you choose. So the most um, least time consuming, I guess, the platform, or it could be more if you want, um, that is very uh, commonly used by researchers um, is Twitter slash X, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Um, and this has, it does not have the most amount of active users. However, up until very recently, it was probably the most used by, by researchers and professionals to kind of talk about their expertise and build their expertise. And I would say personally, this is also where I think I built, built that network, built my brand is really through uh, Twitter and slash X. Um, there is a new app. Um, called Threads, which is by Facebook uh, owner company Meta. And um, it is a kind of a rival <laughs> to Twitter slash X. And, and they're trying to do similar things. Um, but uh, it is just up and coming and something that I've seen a lot of, uh, you know, researchers uh, present on it already talking about their science. Um, I'm a consumer on that side and not really a poster yet. I do post some things, but not a lot. But I do see that as the next kind of big thing for, for researchers to be a kind of getting on. But for now, let's talk about Twitter. Um, Twitter or slash X is where you can do short posts, small posts, 280 characters or less. And you use hashtags um, to, uh, you know, tag topics. You can tag people as well. This is a great way to connect to people in your community in terms of research. Um, so finding other astronomers is very easy for me. Finding other science communicators is very easy for me. Um, if I'm going to a conference, I'm using hashtags for the conference to find other people who are going, doing a little bit of research, who is coming, who is planning to present what. A lot of people post about that on, on Twitter. Um, uh, so getting onto Twitter, I think, if you are planning to, to, to do things on social media is probably one of your first steps. Um, what I do like about uh, Twitter is, you know, giving an example here on, on the screen is... Um, 
doing threads. So yes, you have a very short, uh, you know, character limit to be posting, but you can always create threads. So you can create a post and then reply to your own post to create this, this nice, uh, you know, almost like a blog post <laughs> and, and the premium versions of Twitter. So if you want to pay, um, you can write long form posts, uh, generally from what I understand, they aren't as um, engaging, unless you're super popular uh, on, on Twitter, they aren't as engaging because it requires a lot from people to actually be going through that long form content. Um, so anything in short bites, if you want to share, this could be a day in your lab, if you're working in a lab, here's a picture of me doing X, Y, Z. It's very easy to post on, on Twitter and get people to get engaged in your content. So my example here was just a thread that I uh, posted in 2020 talking about, uh, you know, how to photograph Comet Neowise and how to find it. So that was one of the questions that I was getting a lot is, how do I find this in the night sky? What kind of settings do I use? What kind of camera do I need? And so I just decided that instead of creating a video, which you can still post on Twitter, I think it's around two minutes and 20 seconds of video that you can post in one post. Um, I just decided to use pictures and text to communicate that. And you can also tag other accounts. So you can, so for example, in this example, I have, uh, you know, included um, a, a post that Edler's Planetarium had um, talking about Comet Neovan. So I'm like, oh, I'm talking about it, but here are other cool people who are also talking about it. So in that way, you are engaging with other accounts. Um, and also opening yourself up to their followers. So that's one of the, the really neat thing about Twitter slash um, X um, that I find really engaging. Now threads is similar in that term that you also still have to do short uh, character posts, um, but they only allow one hashtag versus X and slash Twitter allows you multiple hashtags. You can fit as many as you want, as long as they are in the post uh, character limit. Um, and I find that really interesting that you can only use one on threads. And that makes you think about, um, you know, very hard on which with hashtag you would want to use to, to talk about your content. So, yeah. So this is one of the most popular ones with, with researchers. Um, even if you're not active, I would definitely say get on it, uh, try it out, and see um, how you feel. Uh, the interesting part about um, Twitter slash X is that uh, the largest demographic that you would see are like 25 to 34 year olds. So this is kind of where, you know, you have researchers, uh, professionals who are, who are on there. It doesn't mean that you don't have the Gen X, uh, sorry, Gen Z or uh, the older uh, professionals. They are still, they still exist. They are still on, um, on this app, but but it's mostly, uh, you know, 25 to 34 years old. So these are more early career researchers and professionals that you would find. Um, and it's a great way for you to kind of get started and connect it. All right, so next we'll talk about Instagram. This is the other one, uh, other another platform that is very popular uh, with researchers because they want to find a way to either use photos or videos to talk about their research. And, and also, you know, kind of their daily life as researchers as well. I see a lot of grad students sharing, uh, you know, what they, day, what they do in their day-to-day -day, uh, kind of, you know, work. A lot of people have misconceptions about what researchers do every day. And so these people kind of bring in that aspect, um, either using uh, photos or videos, which are called reels on this app, um, and, and they are super popular right now. Um, and this is, again, not the the most um, um, used app. There are only 2 billion <laughs> users. Uh, these are monthly users. Um, but this demographic is a little bit different than the one that's for Twitter slash, um, uh, slash uh, X. So the most demographic that's on this app is 18 to 24 years old. So these are, you know, undergraduate, graduate students uh, and early career researchers who are wanting to get their foot in the door. Um, obviously, it doesn't mean that there doesn't exist a whole set of other people. I'm on it. <laughs> I do not fit that, that age group. Um, but, uh, but what's the interesting part on this is that they have tried to take away um, what 
cool aspects of TikTok are, and they're infusing them into Instagram so that you're not going to TikTok, and I'll talk about TikTok in a second, um, to create content. Um, what's really interesting is that you can post a picture. So here is an example that I have of here that I just posted uh, last month, um, where you can have a cool picture and you can have a long form post uh, about that picture. A picture is what is going to get people's uh, attention as well as the first few lines that you have. So this is why you see what I have here kind of says, I'm one mission will attempt to land on the surface of the moon. Hopefully that text in gets people intrigued about what this is about and they will click and read the whole thing. Um, I personally think that currently, if you want to uh, build um, audiences on Instagram, you really need to be going with reels. Put the volume here. Here is an example of a reel that I created uh, during the pandemic. Um, and you can actually mix with other people's reels. So this person made a reel talking about what their girlfriend was made of. And me as an astronomer, creating and thought, like, like, hello, no, here is what your human is actually made of. And so I kind of talked about the elements, what they're made of, actually from scientifically, um, and just made a reel about it. So you can have fun with the content that you post there, um, which is very interesting. You can uh, post, uh, you know, if people ask you questions on your uh, reels or even on your posts, you can actually create a video with the question that people have asked. So it's a very flexible. There's a lot of like, um, you know, options within the app itself that you can use and create content. So if you are into someone who likes to create videos, you know, this is the app that I would recommend. And something to think about is that, you know, they have uh, limitations on how long uh, things could be. And I do realize that max length of the reel I wrote here is um, one minute actually is 90 seconds. Um, and then the stories is 15 seconds. So this is where you can, you know, promote your content or post things every day. Uh, one thing to remember is that reels are currently being marketed to non-followers. So if you have a certain number of following, if you want to grow your following, posts and reels are the ones that are marketed more to your follow uh, to your non-followers versus stories are more for your followers. So this is kind of where you keep people updated on what you're doing in every day, share your thoughts, et cetera. But if you're really looking to grow, you should be looking at posting or more importantly, creating reels. Okay, so next comes TikTok. <laughs> TikTok is very popular amongst Gen Z. If you're looking to, uh, you know, share what you, the awesome research you're doing, get the next generation really excited about wanting to do this kind of research, this is where you got to be. <laughs> this is where you will find 18 to 24 year olds and even actually younger um, on, on this app. And they consume a lot and it, even though the number of users isn't a lot um it's 1.7 billion compared to 2 billion on on instagram um this is still an app where a lot of people go to um to create content um something to remember is that they do allow three minutes up to three minutes versus instagram is only 90 seconds they do allow up to three minutes of content that you can create inside their app. But if you create a video outside the app and then upload, you can do up to 10 minutes. So you can create a long form content um, on, on TikTok versus you cannot really do that on Instagram. And I think they Instagram really wants you to have short form content so that they can have more um, content that is being consumed by people. Um, and one of the neat things about TikTok is that they really do have amazing, you know, inventory of music and, um, you know, graphics and things like that, that you can use as you're creating this content. I am not, I am not a use, I'm a user of TikTok. I'm not a content creator on TikTok. So I have listed two of, you know, really cool people that I know that create content on TikTok. Uh, Science Bay here, Sarah, um, she does a content creation, um, you know, mainly for youth. Um, and and then we have Space Girl, um, Emily Calendrilli. Uh, she does, she talks all about space. So these are people that, um, you know, I look up to when I look um, at TikTok. Um, you should also remember that TikTok is one of those things uh, that are banned in certain countries. So if you are planning to go on TikTok wanting a certain audience uh, from certain countries, 
you may not get it. So for example, I am from, you know, originally, like I said before, I'm from India. If I wanted to create an audience who was from India, TikTok is not going to be an app for me. I would actually go onto Instagram and create content because TikTok is banned in India and actually in many other countries. So, so yeah, if if you are a consumer of TikTok, I would recommend, you know, look at people and how they're creating content on there uh, to kind of start replicating uh, because TikTok uh, seems to be to have boomed during the pandemic and it seems to still go be going strong. Now, if you're looking for long form content, if you are really wanting to to take someone um, with you and do a deep dive into certain topics, YouTube is your place. Um, I'm again a user of YouTube. I do not create that much content for YouTube, um, but YouTube um, is probably after Facebook the next most uh, users on 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 social media on the internet, basically. And this age group is more towards, you know, 25 to 34 years old. Obviously, there are, um, you know, Gen Zs and, and boomers and everyone um, who are on the app. Um, but if you're targeting a certain audience, YouTube um, can allow you to deep dive into your topics and, and bring more content um, that can be more useful. You know, people post about certain topics, how they solve the problem, they involve people in the process of solving those problem. And so it becomes something that people are really, really engaged in. Um, it is also one of the most time consuming um, platform that you need to create content for if you wanted to do so, just because it allows you to go into deep um, content mode, uh, you will have to spend more time on creating and posting and you know making sure you're promoting it, all of that. Um, Something to think about as you're starting to post about it is that, um, you know, you can post around like 15 minutes if you're unverified account, a verified account takes a bit few steps to be able to do that. Or you can post up to like 12 hours. So you can really, really go into that depth. Though I think the shorter is better always <laughs> on the internet with people's attention skill, uh, attention span nowadays. Um, the more longer you get, the more possibility of you losing people, um, even if it's like a five minute uh, video as well. Um, another thing to think about is you can actually go live on YouTube. Um, and yes, you can go live on Instagram as well um, and Facebook as well. But, uh, but I think if you are planning to create this long form content, having that live part of engagement where you involve people in the, you know, in the work that you're sharing um, seems to get a lot of engagement. So, so if this is something that interests you, this is a place to be. Um, I did want to highlight a few Canadian <laughs> social media superstars to be uh, able for you to kind of go and, uh, you know, get inspiration from. Um, first, I would mention, uh, you know, on Instagram, Samantha Yameen. She also goes by Science Sam. Um, she's a neuroscientist by, by uh, you know, education, but she started her journey on social media when she was a graduate student. So if you go way back, you will see she's sharing what she was doing in lab and how she started communicating on social media and then just like me kind of you know switched her career from academia um into science communication and so you know check her check her out if this is something of your interest you know you'll get inspired by how you could create your own content too um uh, a Twitter is one of the ones that I use the most so the rest of the three I'm going to highlight are going to be on Twitter uh Peter here um he um, is very interested in butterflies and bees, um, and he's actually the outreach coordinator. Um, and uh, you will see him talk a lot about that uh, on his on his platform as well. He also makes a lot of connections doing that. So um, do check out Peter. Um, I also wanted to highlight two Western alumni. Well, one of them is a Western alumni. One of them is is a current uh, graduate student. So Brandon, uh, he is well known as the bird guy. Um, so if you haven't heard about him, definitely go check him out. Um, I have got to know him from social media. So this is here. I'm not on campus all the time, but I've gotten to know him during the pandemic on Twitter. So using your Twitter to talk about your research, 
gets you more connections. And then last but not the least, uh, Dr. Jen, I met her when she was a graduate student um, on campus. She also started talking about her research in botany uh, on social media and, and I follow her. She now lives in Halifax, uh, but I still follow her journey um, and she still talks about science education and botany on her, um, on her Twitter account. So as we come more to, to 120, how do you get started? How do you figure, you know, what do you do next? If this is something that interests you, what is your next step? So what, the first step I already talked about is that start thinking about your personal brand, start thinking about what you're going to talk about. Like I said before, this can evolve over time. Um, for me, it has evolved over time because I started with just you know, wanting to to publicize my uh, the events that I was doing or the cre uh, the activities that I was creating um, to now talking about different space topics, connecting with educators across the country and even North America, and then also, you know, just getting in general people excited about space. And so it has evolved for me and it can happen for you as well. So you can start small saying, I'm just going to talk about my research, maybe just going to talk about how my day looks like <laughs> and, and, you know, get the public involved in, in what a day looks like for, let's say, a biologist. Um, and then you can start thinking, what would be the ideal audience and platform to communicate that to? So, for example, if you're looking to, you know, engage the next generation, I would say either go with TikTok or Instagram. Um, and then once you have kind of that nailed down, then you can start thinking about, okay, how am I going to post, whether I'm gonna do posts or reels, uh, if I'm gonna do reels, uh, what kind of content am I gonna be filming, et cetera. Um, and then just start posting. You will learn as you go. Um, I have learned <laughs> almost everything uh, on my job or while I was doing it. Um, and you just get better at it as you do. And then, you know, thankfully we have an option of like deleting our past videos that we don't like or past posts. And, and even though they stay on, on, on the ether somewhere on the internet, um, they aren't in your profile. So you can modify your personal brand as you go through as well. Um, because as you do uh, go through the posting phase, you will realize what you like and what you don't like. And sometimes you may prefer, you know, just going live or just creating videos versus actually having to write um, or post content in terms of text. Um, so think about those, you know, three steps and just be social and do it. I find social media connecting with people. I've met so many science communicators online and the amount, the awesome amount of work that they do. And I get inspired to do, to do the same. So I'm hoping that you look, when you now look at social media, you will look at it differently if you are thinking of creating content because you're gonna look at what resonates with people. Why is that particular video very popular versus another video that is not? One thing before I close, I will mention is that going viral, <laughs> which seems to be a thing, uh, happens every now and then with some people, um, but consistently doing that uh, should not be an aim for someone just because it is absolutely draining when it comes to mental health. And a lot of people don't talk about it is, is looking for, you know, having more and more followers. I think creating more engagement, creating more of a community with the existing followers you have and the few followers that you're going to, you know, make on your way, I think would give you much more happiness in doing it um, than going behind the viral phase. And the reason why I say this is because you will see on social media that a lot of people are wanting, you know, 100,000, 200,000 million followers. That's kind of their goal and great for them. However, I think when it comes to being a researcher, what you really should care about is making the meaningful connections and, and the connections that would last longer. People who can vouch for you, people who can think of you when opportunities come in place, um, you know, for, for, for someone to recommend someone, um, they need to be thinking about you. And the way you do it is actually create personal connections with people. Um, one simple way to be able to do that is actually commenting on other people's content and getting to know them. So DMing them, um, being like, hey, I really like this piece of information that you posted. I would want to know more about X, Y, Z. Um, and, and people get really excited about being engaged um, with their followers. So, so just a piece of advice <laughs> from someone who has been doing it for a very, very long time. 
And so I'll just pause here um, and I'll take, uh, you know, we have 10 minutes. I'll take uh, questions.